thanks very much, um, Andy, and to, to ODI and the panelists for, for having me here. Um, we had initially, if you recall, in October of 2012, an initial um, sort of a brainstorming on before this work had actually commenced. So it's a real pleasure to be back here to report back on, on that and many other brainstormings that formed a part of the process for this report. Um, as Andy pointed out, this is um, this is a report that actually. Do you think I could have this because sure. I can't yeah. see Go very ahead. well? Yeah. Get that. Um, so uh, th this is a report, as Andy pointed out, is one of three flagship reports from the Social Development Department at the World Bank. And um, in a sense, I mean, the time, um, it's sort of, it's one of those reports where the time seemed to be right because there was the high-level panel on the 20, post-2015 agenda. Um, there was a whole host of other issues that were kind of coming up almost to broil, um, for instance, uh, you know, issues with, with regard to LGBT populations the world over, um, with regard to, for instance, migrants also the world over, huge amounts of, of almost of xenophobia that seems to be emerging not just in the Western world but in other countries as well. So in a sense, this was a report whose moments seemed to be to be right. Um, what it does is it basically uh, def it, it defines social inclusion because, as you know, social inclusion is notoriously many things <coughs> to many people. It's pretty much anyone that's doing something right in the social realm uh, tends to call it social I inclusion, and it's one of the most loosely bandied about terms currently in the development discourse. Um, so then the terms inclusive growth, inclusive, in, you know, all kinds of nouns, adverbs, um, adjectives are, are doing the rounds around inclusion. So one of the big challenges before us was to actually define what social inclusion is and to provide a f framework for thinking about it. So what this report does is it actually tries to put boundaries around this extremely abstract notion of social inclusion. It it. it brings out issues of who may be excluded and why they may be excluded in certain contexts. In a sense, it positions the World Bank Group much more solidly within the post-2015 uh, agenda. Um, it also shows, so it sort of ends in, a, in an optimistic note because previously work that had emerged um, from the World Bank and elsewhere really focused on exclusion. So this, uh, to, in order to focus on inclusion, it's kind of a step forward and it, it sort of makes the broad point that social inclusion is possible and there's actually something that development actors like the World Bank and others that can do something about it. So it ends on that, on that note that this is not some horrible diagnostic of exclusion, which it is in some sense, but that there is a way forward on that. Um, within the World Bank, it actually builds on a series of previous uh, world development reports, work on inequality, of equality of opportunity, on voice and agency, on norms. So there has been, especially over the last decade, a considerable body of literature that has come from the World Bank, but then also a much larger body of literature that has come from outside of the World Bank. So um, it's in a sense an attempt to synthesize some of that, but also use um, <coughs> sort of, we like to think more creatively, a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods, a mix of disciplines to come at a, um, a determination of what social inclusion could be in the current context and going forward. Um, one of the things that we've been very happy about has been a range of partnerships that we've had, both within the World Bank as well as outside of the World Bank. So that has really informed and enriched this, this conversation. Um, okay. So what is social inclusion? And we started with the definition that the EU had, which we liked very much. Um, it's just that once you once you try and recite that definition, it's a little difficult to to remember where it started and where it ended. Although it's highly comprehensive, so one of the challenges before us was to really come up with a definition that that people could say in a mouthful. And so we think about social inclusion as the process of improving the terms for individuals and groups to take part in society. And then we have a slightly expanded, and so th that definition is actually notoriously um, is, is actually deceptively simplistic. Um, the, we have a larger and a, and a more elaborate definition that says it's the process of improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity of individuals that are disadvantaged <coughs> on the basis of their identity so that they can take part in society. And if you break down that definition in its constituent parts, you actually find that this has, this has much more to it that, that needs to be digested. So first, in effect, 
we say that social inclusion is both a process as well as an outcome. So it, it is it is the process of improving the terms. It's about ability, opportunity, and dignity, which I'll talk about a little bit um, in, in, in the next few slides. But I think what's really important and that we bring out is that social inclusion is many things to many people, partly because it's so context specific. So not only is it context specific in geographical terms, so the same issue may not be considered as an issue of social exclusion um, in Brazil as it is in China or as it is in the UK, but even in the same space. So even in Brazil, and we, we walk through this example of Brazil, in the, in the 1970s in Brazil, it was, it was the, the rhetoric of a racial democracy was a very strong rhetoric. Race was not considered to be an axis of exclusion in Brazil at all. And then a few years ago, Brazil actually instituted quotas for Afro-descendants. So what happened from the 1970s to now, clearly the discourse on social inclusion had changed. So in that respect, it's highly context specific. It's also very multidimensional, which this is a, uh, this is a very um, sophisticated audience. I don't, <coughs> I don't need to describe what that would mean. But it, it's sort of layered in many different ways. It affects individuals through in the political, in the social, in the economic, and many other realms. Um, I think one of the one of the discussions that we have in this in this book is that it's often used interchangeably with either poverty reduction or with equality. And we say that you know it could be about poverty and inequality, but it needn't be about po poverty and inequality. Often, it goes beyond issues of poverty and inequality. <coughs> we use um, an example in this book uh, where we say, you know, think about a rich gay man um, in several countries, particularly certain countries in Africa. He's not affected by um, he's not affected by poverty. He's not affected by income inequality, but he is excluded almost to the risk of death. So um, those. Those are the kinds of examples that we bring out where we say, you know, this is a process as well as an outcome, whereas poverty and inequality are almost always outcomes that have usually a single metric that's attached to them. Um, the World Bank came out with two new goals. For the first time, there were two goals that the World Bank came out with in, um, in, in last October. And these were ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And, and we believe that this idea of social inclusion is intrinsic to both extreme poverty because certain groups tend to be overrepresented among the poor and to shared prosperity because growth is leaving uh, several people behind and, and it isn't just leaving poor people behind, it is leaving behind people who are disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. Um, we also make the point in this report that it's perhaps more of an issue today than it was a decade ago. But I guess any report that comes out or any, any large piece of work that comes out thinks that the moment for that report is today and not yesterday and not tomorrow. Um, we do have a chapter <coughs> actually that, that looks at these mega transitions and mega uh, transformations that have taken place in the realm of, for instance, and this is a bit of a busy slide, um, that, that basically says that, you know, there have been huge, say, demographic changes. So uh, the earlier preoccupation with fertility decline and mortality tr decline has actually given way to a very volatile new trend, well, not so new, but a very volatile trend, which is migration. So migration is the most volatile trend of today and is going to be, and it affects many, many countries. And when I say affects many, many countries, one of the other the messages that we have in this report is that social inclusion is not a developing country issue alone. So it in, in fact blurs the distinction between developed countries and developing countries. So take, the, take a look at the demographic transitions. Demo demographic transitions in Africa have an impact on the United Kingdom. Demographic transitions in in, in Poland or in Romania have an impact on, uh, on the United Kingdom. Very low fertility in many countries, in many OECD countries, increases the demand for migrants. And yet, when migrants do come in, there's a very difficult uh, social processes that are unleashed. Similarly, there are spatial transitions which are to do with urbanization, which are to do with, with climate change, that focus on certain, th that have um, sort of an an inordinate impact on certain groups compared to others. So we have these four kinds of transitions, economic transitions, and then transitions in what we call knowledge and ICT. 
So to give you an example of this transition, there's been a huge growth in education in, in developing countries in particular. And so you now have a workforce which is educated probably not skilled enough, but it is educated. And what that means is that there is now a growing middle class in many of these countries. What it also means is that aspirations and expectations of these people are very different from the state and from the elites than they were a decade ago. So these are the big transitions that we place the discussion of social inclusion within. Um, I also wanted to sort of draw your attention to this this painting, which which you know we liked a lot. This is a Ugandan painter called Mukasa, who, um, um, you know, who, who brings this issue of sort of transformations into into his work, and and so that's sort of a, a complete digression that was irrelevant, but um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sort of always struck by this painting whenever I look at it. Um, then we say, okay, so. Um, inclusion in what? So when uh, is there a way in which we can provide a framework to think about these issues? And again, we have a, I think, a deceptively simple framework, which is inclusion in what? Inclusion, we say, in markets, in services, and spaces. And when we talk about markets, there's something, you know, the World Bank and other banks find very intuitive and very easy to deal with, which is land markets, labor markets, credit markets. And what we say is that l whether you look at land markets or you look at labor markets, A, that they are linked, and B, and we give this example where we say that, look, la land markets and labor markets are, are so linked that uh, certain groups tend to be disadvantaged for not owning land and so ending up in s occupations where they tend to be more segregated and then also have low access to credit. So there is a kind of a, within markets, there is a kind of a, s a mutually reinforcing cycle that takes place. But then across these three realms, markets, services, and spaces, um, again, services is something that is that is easily comprehensible. So it's not just health and education services that we're talking about. We're talking about infrastructure as a service. We're talking about electricity, water. Um, we're talking about a range of different services. And so we move away from uh, infrastructure as a physical entity to infrastructure as an enabler, and uh, infrastructure as a um, as as a divider. Um, so infrastructure as a service. And then we bring out this idea of, serv of spaces. And we think about spaces both in its physical sense as well as in its metaphorical sense, almost in a metaphysical sense in a, se in a way, where, where we say that spaces are physical spaces, cultural spaces, <laughs> political spaces. And, and we have this discussion within the report that there is an intersection of spatial and social exclusion. So uh, try and think of indigenous peoples the world, the, the world over. They tend to have low access to markets and services, but they also tend to remain confined to certain physical spaces, <coughs> which are forested areas, remote forested areas, where services are, are very difficult to reach them. But underlying all of that is their lack of voice that seems to be, um, that seems to be defining their exclusion. And then we say, okay, exclusion, how? Um, and we look at ability, opportunity, and dignity. And, and there's another example that runs through this entire, um, this entire piece, which is this example that we give of a tribal and Adivasi woman in India. Um, we use the National Family Health Survey in India, which says that, look, very few women in India where maternal mortality rates are extremely high, um, very few people give birth in health centers or in, in institutions. Okay, so in 2005, for which which is the, unfortunately the last available uh, data, about 40% of Indian women tended to give birth in institutions. But only 20%, so 40% is an abysmal number in and of itself, but 20% of Adivasi women were able to give birth in health centers. And then uh, the survey actually asks women who did not give birth in health centers, well, why didn't you give birth in a health center if you had had a child in the last three years? And one would expect, you know, it would be, um, you know, it was too, it's too expensive or there was no transport or the doctor wasn't available. All of those matter, but they matter very little. The most overwhelming response that comes through is that we did not think it necessary. And the minute health providers and, and policymakers take a look at that number, 72% that say we did not think it necessary, they say, oh, look, now there's low demand for health care. There's low demand for health care. We have doctors in place. We have, uh, we have um, uh, attendants in place. But these women just will not give birth in health centers. And, and it's a cultural issue. So it's, it's branded as a cultural issue about which the state can do very little. 
But then if you do a little bit more qualitative work with, with these women and you ask them why did you actually not give birth in a health center, you, it turns out that the, that the chasm between the health providers and tribal women is so large and the way they are treated in the health centers is, is something that they, they absolutely reject the term. So hence, um, we go back to our, our original <coughs> formulation of improving the terms for individuals and groups to take part in society and bringing in ideas of dignity and um, to, to, this, to, to the development discourse as a mainstream issue. And, and to speak, speaking about dignity, when we brought this idea into sort of core development um, audiences, it was sort of, oh yeah, this fuzzy stuff, dignity, it's very nice, you really should treat people with respect. Well, actually it turns out, the idea of dignity, um, there is a very strong foundation, of course, in, in the work of uh, a range of, of, uh, of theorists, but also there is increasing amount of empirical work that's looking at death with dignity, aging <coughs> with dignity. There are ways in which you can measure dignity. And so uh, we're bringing dignity sort of much more center stage. And it's very interesting, uh, you're talking about how it affects the World Bank. The, the chief economist in the Middle Eastern region said, you know, the issue in the Middle East is about dignity. And so the idea of dignity, I think, is finding much more of a central place, not as this fuzzy notion of, yes, yes, that's very nice, but to say that that could actually be causing bad outcomes that you're not able to put your finger on uh, the causes for. We have been pushed quite hard to come up with a measure on social inclusion. And we've really pushed back on that because um, my sense is that the minute you put one measure on social inclusion, you've pretty much closed the conversation on social inclusion. And it's very difficult to put one measure when an issue is so context specific. So when pushed, we point people to a range of different, hmm, where did I go, okay. Uh, when pushed, we po point, uh, okay, that's the, Next one, yeah. So when uh, we actually point people to these um, various dashboards that exist, which where you can actually create your own uh, measure of social inclusion slash inequality slash multidimensional poverty. But what we say is that when you're thinking about measuring social inclusion, think first about what you mean by social inclusion. And we have a sort of a, a somewhat trite response to people who say, help us measure it. We say, okay, tell me what you think it is and I'll tell you if you can measure it. But then we also say that there are different ways in which you can measure it and we, we actually use Bolivian census data um, and census because of sample, sample sizes and all, all kinds of other reasons where we look at secondary school completion in Bolivia and we say secondary school completion in Bolivia is actually pretty good. So uh, education outcomes in Bolivia are pretty good. But then you control for a few things and you say, okay, compared to a Spanish-speaking Bolivian man, the chances of a Spanish-speaking Bolivian woman completing secondary school education goes down only by 5%. So there's relative gender parity in, in secondary school completion in Bolivia. But if you were a Quechua-speaking Bolivian man, you, that probability would go down by 14%. Now, if you were a Quechua-speaking Bolivian woman, that probability would go down by 28%. So we use some of these ways to show people that there are actually ways in which you can measure social exclusion or inclusion using classic outcomes that you do otherwise, you, you use anyway. And then um, we, we dwell a little bit on this idea of identity. So ethnicity is one area where, where people know pretty well. But then, for instance, in Africa, what does ethnicity mean? And that conversation is a whole other conversation that, that's ongoing. Um, there's ethnicity, there's gender, there is race and religion and, and all, all kinds of ways in which people identify themselves. But we say that it's not one identity. So nobody is just a woman or just a tribal or just, just someone um, from a sexual minority. It's the intersection of some of these identities that overlays the disadvantage. So there's a multiplication of identities. And you talked about uh, intersectionality. That's, that's something sort of front and center in this work where we say it's this Venn diagram and it's where the intersections are that, be that becomes um, central to the way exclusion plays out. Um, one of the other things we do in this, in this report is that oh, we say perceptions matter. We say people act on the basis of how they perceive the world, and now there are many, many data sets. For instance, we use the World Value Survey, we use the barometer surveys to actually say that there is often, and we use actually this, this quote from Pierre Bordeaux, but um, to take a look at this graph where the World Value Survey actually asks people, whom would you not like to have as a neighbor? 
And would you not like to have someone who comes from, who's a foreigner, who speaks a different language, um, who's from a different race, from a different religion? And um, answers really vary depending on context. So, and it's also quite interesting to see uh, change over time. Countries that started with a highly tolerant base suddenly show very sharp changes. And those changes are also context specific. So those changes are, has there been an infusion of migration because of which there is an antipathy to migrants? We actually find that is the case, that there is a, a very strong correlation between actual trends and perceived, um, so perceptions, so public perceptions about some of these issues. And it's an exhortation to people and to policymakers to take perceptions very seriously. So to give you this example, so our attitudes and perceptions linked to outcomes, we took a look at female labor force participation rates. And then we took a, a, a look at the perception or an attitude where people say if jobs were sh in short supply, women should have a lower entitlement to jobs. So people who have conservative notions on that front actu actually also have low levels of female labor force participation. No causality there, it's just that there is a certain correlation between attitudes in a society and actual outcomes as, we, as, as seen by measured, uh, measured data. So this sounds like a bit of a slogan, but I think it's it's really important to make the make the point that change towards social inclusion is possible. It has taken place in the past. There are very many examples of change towards social inclusion. Um, in a sense, change is inevitable, and 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 whether it occurs towards inclusion or towards exclusion, change does happen. Um, we also say that policies, programs, and institutions have a very strong role. Activism has a very strong role. Change may well be political, and we say don't shy away from that. It is political. And I think taking into account the political economy of change is extremely important to taking that, that, um, that forward. Change is about partnerships. So we go through four or five examples of change. I already mentioned to you the way Brazil moved from this rhetoric of a racial democracy to focusing on racial identity. Um, institutions say in Bangladesh, there is informal justice systems in Bangladesh uh, that used to be highly exclusionary. The Shalish in Bangladesh used to be a highly in exclusionary forum. It has tended to become less exclusionary over time, what happened. Um, foot binding in China, one of the most egregious examples of, uh, of, of exclusion of women from a certain range of, of opportunities. Um, a centuries old tradition that pretty much vanished in the space of a couple of decades. So obviously something changed there. Uh, we look at educational outcomes for women in Jordan. So in the 80s, there was hardly any women in higher education. To the late 90s, there are actually more women in higher education, highly educated women, than there are men highly educated. <coughs> Um, and then the question is, so what? So now that we've done all this diagnostic, what does this actually mean going forward? Um, and this is a, what we call a stylized steps. Um, one of the exhortations in this report is to ask why. So we say, don't accept that certain people, so we're very good in the World Bank with, say, poverty diagnostics. And we say, okay, certain groups tend to be overrepresented among the poor. And we say, OK, so why are certain groups overrepresented among the poor? It's not enough for us to accept that you know, certain trends just happen to obtain. What we are saying is that certain trends or certain, certain outcomes obtain for certain reasons that probably go back in history and have an institutional basis to it. So um, we, have, we say, OK, design actions. Um, monitor progress and create avenues for, uh, for recourse. Um, one of the things, again, that we say in this report is that policies towards social inclusion don't necessarily do more. They do things differently. So this is not about throwing money at the problem to have it go away. It's about looking at the issue a little bit differently and, and moving forward. It's a long-term agenda. Um, and I think planning for social inclusion um, really requires an inordinate amount of patience. A very few uh, one stroke of the pen reforms, um, long, often long gestation periods. So people who are designing projects, uh, if you're expecting huge impacts in a three year period, chances are you're not going to see those impacts and you're going to end up saying that that program was a failure. You may see either unintended consequences, or you may actually see consequences that suddenly come up seven years down the line that you hadn't actually a anticipated. And you say, oh, maybe it was that project that we funded in 2004 that we're actually seeing the impacts of. We don't know. But think a little bit 
a, a little bit longer term. Um, and then there are inclusive settlements that, so when we look, to look at the political economy of change, it's really about ways in which we can have inclusive settlements. Finally, we say that social inclusion will always be work in progress. So uh, a policy that leads to inclusion today will likely upset the power balance and may likely lead to exclusion of different groups. So a policy that you put in place today that has good impact may actually succeed in, in excluding um, a certain group of people. And so then you have, it's, it's almost an ongoing agenda that doesn't really go away. So in terms of next steps, and this is something we get asked a lot, so um, what are you going to do now? Uh, and we see that the report was really a promise of action. And, and this is often uh, within the World Bank, and this is now we're focusing much more on influencing change within the, within the World Bank. Um, the team that, that I lead in, in the World Bank, um, we are providing a lot of support to other teams that do very core operational work in, in the World Bank. We have a series of principles by which we <coughs> engage, not just within the World Bank, but with partners externally as well. And we have, we've been very fortunate in the kind of interest that this, this work has received and a lot of, uh, lot of people want to engage. We say there needs to be clear demand. We're not pushing this agenda. Someone else has to push it. <coughs> Number two, um, there has to be a promise of high impact. Um, so we're not going to be, you know, you can do things <coughs> that, that move the deck chairs, uh, but is there high impact? Is there potential for sustainability? Because we're not going to do this for you forever. And is there potential for an ongoing long-term collaboration? Finally, in terms of what we're doing, um, we're doing a lot of knowledge sharing, so connecting people as well as, as, as moving this agenda through a range of different forums. Many of them are online forums. Uh, we're doing some um, some work that's new, that's, um, that again is in response to demand from certain countries. Uh, we are investing a lot of time in training. So after this, I'm going to be in Uganda and we're doing training for Ministry of Finance officials in really trying to think about social inclusion in their, um, in their planning processes uh, and then building, building new partnerships. Uh, one of the things that we are very happy about is that we've taken a look at the World Bank's portfolio over the last three years of all projects, the lending projects that were approved in the last, last three years, and have built a methodology to assess social inclusion. And to give you a sneak preview of that, essentially we are saying it doesn't, <coughs> so we have a very strong safeguards, and many of you may actually know that. We have very strong uh, safeguards policies in the World Bank. Uh, that doesn't cut it. Um, having Just having social safeguards is not about social inclusion. Just doing poverty reduction is not about social inclusion. What's the innovation? How can we assess a policy that actually, or a program that actually advances social inclusion? Uh, we have plans to actually launch this work very soon. Uh, we are doing soft launches within the World Bank, which means consulting with teams, because this is this may end up being quite controversial and quite uh, contested, and we hope that it is, because that's where conversations will happen. Finally, please um, stay in touch with us. We have um, many, many ongoing uh, online forums. Um, if you type in your browser, Social Inclusion Plus World Bank, it'll take you to our Social Inclusion page, um, blog for us, um, and essentially talk to us on these issues. Thank you. <coughs>